Amen. I'm going to suggest that today we're going to encounter one of the hardest passages in Scripture. I'm going to put it in like the top three. Top three hard passages, which means that we're just going to read out of Winnie the Pooh today instead. <laughs> the Hundred Acre Wood is a friendly place, Alvin, and I like to live there. We're talking about Jesus' command to hate your family. To hate your family. You're going, what? I know, that's what I said too. But Diedrich Bonhoeffer, he was a theologian and a spy in World War II. He was part of an assassination attempt against Hitler back in Germany. Died a martyr, a young man in, I believe, his early 40s, shortly before the war ended. But in his short life, he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. And in that book, he introduces a concept that he called cheap grace. Cheap grace. And this is not the same thing as the, the free grace that Christ offers, but that we cheapen the grace of Christ by refusing to count the cost of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And this comes full bore right in front of us, bright lights in our eyes. We cannot escape today the cost of discipleship. How do we hate our families and love Jesus above all things in obedience to his commands? Let's talk about it. We're going to read first in Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, and then 25 to 35 in, in your Bibles, or it'll be up on the screens. One Sabbath, when he went in to eat at the house of one of the leading Pharisees, they were watching him closely. There in front of him was a man whose body was swollen with fluid. In response, Jesus asked the law experts and the Pharisees, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to heal or not? But they kept silent. He took the man, healed him, and sent him away. And to them he said, Which of you whose son or ox falls into a well will uh, not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day. But they could find no answer to these things. Over to verse 25. Now great crowds were traveling with him, so he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and cannot finish, all the onlookers will begin to ridicule him, saying, This man started to build and wasn't able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king will not first sit down and decide if he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If not, while the other is still far off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. In the same way, therefore, every one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. Now salt is good, but if salt should lose its taste, how will it be made salty? It isn't fit for the soil or for the manure pile. They throw it out. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen. Our saltiness is at stake. I have, I have gotten some manure from Jim, the, the Angus rancher here. Jim, can you imagine saying, this is so worthless, I will not even put it in my manure pile. You, you will ruin my poop if I put you in there. That is pretty rough, pretty rough. So our saltiness is on the line here. Three things we want to consider. One is how Jesus treated the crowds. As we consider how Jesus treated the crowds, that's going to give us a primer for what it means, what he's talking about here to hate these relationships that God says are most dear. Two, we're going to look at that in depth. Unless you hate, you cannot be my disciple. And three, we're going to talk about the cost, the cost of discipleship. 
Number one, how Jesus treated the crowds. When we look at how Jesus treated the crowds, we can get this sort of primer on the cost of discipleship. What it means to hate your family and to love God above all. The first in this area is that Jesus did not delight in what the crowds had to offer him. And they offered him a lot. In John 2, 24 and 25, it says, Jesus, however, would not entrust himself to them, for he knew what was in the heart of man. What was in the heart of man? It's on full display in that Passion Week, coming in to the Hosannas one week later, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Paul felt a very similar expression, comes into a city praised as a god with his partner Barnabas because of a miracle they did. The next day, stone him to death, leave him for dead. He knew, Jesus, what was in the heart of man, and our praise and our hearts are fickle. John 6, 15, he withdrew from an attempt to make him king by force. He had just fed the, the 5,000, and he says, they're going to make me king. He knew it in his heart, and so he withdraws because he would not submit to the earthly praise. Luke eleven twenty nine, he straight up looks at the crowds that are following him and calls them an evil generation. He says, you're an evil people. Dave, is that a good growth strategy? No, he, Deacon Dave knows better than that. Luke 18, 18 to 19, good teacher. Jesus says, why do you call me good? He refused to receive earthly flattery or exaltation, and he himself refused to flatter. At any time by his own authority or by submitting to temptation, he could have become the king. He could have sat down on David's earthly throne as the prophecy foretold would happen, he could have grasped it. Satan offered it to him. Satan said, I'll give you the world. Just worship me. The crowds offered it of Jerusalem, of Israel at the time, said, come, be our king. He rejected all of it. What did he take? He had a higher obligation. He would not settle for a cheap imitation of the real glory and honor that he knew was his reward for obedience to the Father. And this demonstrates to us that our esteem, our glory is not to come from one another. Do I like it when people say to me, nice sermon, Pastor, that was really uplifting. Of course I do. Someone said to me, that was a real stinker, man. I might hurt my, hurt my feelings. But that's not supposed to be the source of our esteem. And the second in this, Jesus knew the cost. Luke 12, 50, he said, but I have a baptism to undergo and how it consumes me until it is finished. He knew where he was going. He knew what lied ahead of him. Matthew 26, 39, Jesus pleads with God, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. After his water baptism in the Jordan, there's no doubt that Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, knew the timeline of his life. He was ready, equipped for mission. He spent 40 days fasting in the wilderness, preparing for what lied before him. He knew where he was going from the beginning. He would not be diverted. He knew the cost, and he paid a higher cost than any when he took on the sin of the world, Scripture says when he became sin. This is perhaps one of the greatest and most tragic miracles that Scripture records, the becoming of sin of Jesus. And when his father turns his back on him in that terrible moment and Jesus faces that agony, we don't ever have to count a cost that high. But we do have to count the cost. And the last thing that we know about Jesus from his life is that he loved God above all. He renounced earthly and blood relationships in favor of spiritual ones forged by God. Luke 8, 19 and 21, and Luke eleven twenty seven 27 to 28, he is given opportunities to exalt his family 
in both of those instances. And in both those instances, he declines and he says, who is really my family? It's the one who does the will of God. Who is the family of Jesus? Who is your spiritual family? Who is your real family? It is those who do the will of God. Matthew 23, 8, Jesus says, Do not call anyone on earth your father, because you have one father who is in heaven. He's saying those earthly relationships, whether it's a spiritual fatherhood, if I confess Christ to you, and God quickened your spirit, and you came into the saving family of God by submitting to the Lord, I became your spiritual father, but we'll have no titles. Jesus broke no titles. In fact, it's probably against the commands of Christ when you say to me, Pastor Sean. Jesus might say, you have one pastor. He is your heavenly shepherd. Don't call anyone else your pastor. Don't call anyone else your spiritual leader. Don't acknowledge any other relationship. He demonstrated total obedience, rejecting all those relationships. And again, in Matthew 26, 39, he says, not as I will. I have a plan. I have a desire. Jesus, he was a human. I don't want to be whipped, beaten, crucified. Luke records the drops of blood that fall from his face. He is so anguished, but not as I will. Jesus gained nothing from and put no stock in the crowds. He could have avoided everything that happened to him had he chosen to, but God's plan for our salvation would not have been accomplished. It was his love for God that prompted him to do the work that he did. He had to hate the idea of these earthly connections so that he was free to love God and develop the love that God desired for all humanity. That brings us down into our selection here today. Let's start by focusing on those difficult verses, 25 through 27. Unless you hate, you cannot be my disciple. So the last time he turned to the crowds, Dave, he called them evil. Now there's... Those were large crowds. They've upgraded. Now they're great. Great crowds this time. Second time he turns to address the crowds. Unless you hate your family, you can't even be my disciple. Go home. Are we still good, church growth strategy? We on track? I don't. So the reason this caused me to have such angst in my heart is that I preach to you folks every Sunday how we are to follow the commands of Christ. And this section seems to contradict so much of everything that was taught by Jesus and by his disciples. Let me give you just a smattering of things that appear to contradict this. Then we have to resolve it. We have to figure it out. 1 John 2.11 John says, but the one who hates his brother or sister is in darkness. Okay. Genesis 2.24 says of the wife, the husband will cleave to the wife, and they'll become one flesh. Paul commenting on this says no one ever hates his own flesh. Husbands, he says in Ephesians 5.25, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Colossians 3, 18 to 22, husbands, love your wives, don't be bitter towards them. Titus 2, 4, the older women need to teach the younger women to love their husbands and their children. 1 Peter 3, 7, we're commanded as husbands, show honor to your wives so that your prayers won't be hindered. If you don't honor your wife, God won't hear your prayers, all right? 1 Corinthians 7, a defense of marriage, prescriptions for it. And then John's chap- John chapters 13 to 15, you try to count on all your fingers and toes how many times Jesus says to love, love, love each other, love each other. That's my command, love each other. Even Matthew 5, perhaps the topper of it all, 
love your enemies. But, Luke 14, hate your family. I'm a little worked up here about all this. That's all right. We're going to get through it. We can see how elevated God put the family relationships. Really, in its perfect form, it is a representation of the Trinity, how two can become one and from that oneness can generate life. It's a microcosm for the rest of our relationships. We are to have this unified front. We are the body. We are the one flesh of God here to go and to do. And yet here Jesus seems to take all that and says to hate it if we're to be eligible to even walk in his ways. How do we deal with this tension? Well, Matthew does us a favor because in his rendition, chapter 10, 37 to 39, he records the exact same teaching, but he uses the words, if you love these more than me. That, may, that takes some of the pressure off, doesn't it? But let's imagine we're living in first century times, and all I have is Luke. Luke is the gospel that circulated through my community. I don't know that Matthew alleviated some of the tension. What do I do? How do I deal with this? And as always, we have Revelation 2 forward. Jesus warns against abandoning the love that you had at first. The teaching here is that the only love that we are allowed to have is love of God. The only love we are allowed to have is the love of God. Maybe you might ask me, well, well Sean, Maybe there's some hidden secret in the Greek word for hate that Jesus uses here. Well, it's meseo. Meseo means hate, to wish ill against, to hope that they were be cursed. No, that doesn't help us. We can have no other love but the love of God. No other attachment is permitted. This is a situation. We have one relationship. You get one. That's God. If you don't have that, you cannot have any other relationships in your life. We're not going to wiggle out of this scripture. There's no way to look at this at its face and say, well, Jesus didn't really mean to hate your family. If he didn't mean that, he wouldn't have said it, right? I, it's so easy to wiggle out of this stuff, say, well, he didn't really mean he didn't really intend. He did intend. You can have no other attachments. God in his grace then permits something to happen, though. Because we can't ignore all the rest of Scripture. All those beautiful Scriptures that we like, that we just read. Love each other. That's the God I'm familiar with. That's the God I know. Love each other. But how can I love you if I am absent from the source of love? How can I care about you if I'm absent from the one from whom all passions flow? It's impossible. It's impossible. And through our love for God, we can see with godly eyes and see rightly and be fully committed to, uh, to Christ. We can see how to love others as he commands. But everything that we read, all that cool stuff about loving our family, loving each other, love being the command of Christ, is impossible. It's down here. It's buried under the foundation of this church. You can't get there without God. Let's see in this a faith works analogy. If I engage in the work without faith, God despises my works. They have no merit. They're not good. He thinks they're disgusting. But if I love God, if I have faith and out of my love of God I go and I serve others, then God loves my work. And in fact, he requires it. So works on the one sense are disgusting to God without faith. Works in the other sense are mandatory. They are an element of my salvation under the love of God. So I cannot love you there's no way that I can care for you outside of the love of God. And this is what Jesus is teaching us here today. Unless we start here with the love of God above all things, 
It is impossible. God despises the love that we show outside of him. So what does this mean? Look at all these do-good ministries, social justice ministries that on their surface do good things. They feed the hungry. They house the homeless. They give money. They give food. Does God love those things? He hates them. Why does he hate them? Because he hates the, ministry, the, the work itself because it didn't generate from him. Scripture says the law is written on our hearts. Saved or unsaved, it is written on the hearts of all mankind. Everybody knows. And if they say they don't, they're liars, deceiving themselves, having been deceived so fully. So we feed the hungry outside of Christ. We house the homeless outside of Christ. But outside of Christ, those works are despicable. So we need to start with love. Let's talk a little bit about this cost. Jesus says, count it. Jesus, in verses 28 to 35, does not permit you to casually come to him. He doesn't allow it. If you do, you will find that you have attempted to confess a Christ that you never knew. I've used this analogy before, but I really love it. One of my seminary professors said, imagine a scenario where there's a, a nice, pretty young gal sitting in the back of a movie theater ready to watch the newest show that's come out. And a handsome, young, first-year seminary student comes and sits down next to her. and says, hi, we've never met. Let's get married today. No, you're nuts. But let's get to know each other a little bit. Let's decide if I, I know who you are. Now, it's not as if we're trying to court Christ, but Jesus says you need to know what's being asked of you. You need to be aware before you can follow him. If I say, you know, I love calculus, I love that level of math, well, have you ever taken a class? No, but I just think it's fantastic. I love Jesus. Do you read his words? Well, no, but I just know that I do. It's impossible. It's impossible. You need, we need to have an educated faith. Josh McDowell writes a great book called Don't Check Your Brain at the Door. We don't invite you to come into this place, shut down your rationale and your intellect, and just receive whatever is thrown at you. God made your mind. He made the intellect. It's made to be submitted to him, but he loves it when you approach him in a rational way. Come and let us reason together, he says. Come and let's talk. Alvin made the point in Sunday school. Whatever you hear up here, you have an obligation to check it out. Is it good? Did I give you good information? Or was I reading People magazine all week and I bring to you the, the latest pop message? You have to watch out. We all have to watch out for each other, to guard against wolves and those evil things that would try to come in to divide us. Count the cost of what it means to follow Christ. And here he lays it out so plainly. It's the abandonment of everything else to his glory and to his honor. When you attempt to follow after Christ, but you don't spend time contemplating and studying his words, these harsh commands are going to overwhelm you. You won't be able to survive. These will crush you. Jesus said, I'm the cornerstone. Fall on me and be crushed or be shattered. I'll fall on you and you'll be crushed. We cannot sustain. The word is too much. We weren't prepared. Jesus asked for everything. We only wanted to give some. He said, come and follow me, but I wanted to stay put. Count the cost. When this happens, we begin to despair. As the salt of the earth, we start to lose our flavor. And when despair overcomes us, we submit to helplessness. And our distinctive flavor disappears. And we are fit for nothing in kingdom purposes. Saltless salt. Not even fit for the manure pile. What's its fate? Thrown out. Get away from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Jesus says, how do we avoid this? 
We avoid this by keeping Christ first. If you reach the spiritual level when all you need, all you need is the assurance that God loves you and that you are working according to his purposes, you have reached the level that God wants you to be at. You're probably dead. You're probably dead at that point. But that's, that's the height to say, I don't need anything. We can be like Paul and say, plenty, want, I've lived through it all and I'm content in everything. I desire the relationships. He told Timothy, come before winter in his last letter, his final lines, come before winter. Bring my cloak, bring my stuff. I'm lonely, I'm cold, come and see me. But if you don't, I'm content in Christ. Can we get there? Can we be that man? Can we have that faith? That's the bar. That's the standard that Jesus sets here. Only Jesus. We sing it in that little soulful melody we just sang. All I want, all my ambitions, my hopes and dreams, I submit it to Jesus. Good words. Hard. Impossible even. But that's the crushing reality of our Lord. If we can get to the point where when Jesus says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, we are satisfied. We've made it. We want to love to study his word that teaches what he's required, what he requires. We will not entrust ourselves to man. We will not seek the esteem of any human. It's only Christ above all. So church, you are invited today count the cost if you have been walking in a faith where you have not yet engaged this effort today is the day while it's still called today do it there's a reading plan in the back of your bulletins take you through the old testament once and the new testament twice every year you say man well it's already september it's all right start we just started revelation we're going to start over again in uh, the start of the New Testament in just a couple weeks. It's a great time to get engaged. Don't neglect to count the cost. He bids you, come and die. Will you?